Okay, uh, welcome to the Raspberry Jam number six for Singapore. Uh, and without further ado, I'm just going to hand you over to Luther, who quickly wants to speak a little bit about Hackerspace. Welcome you all here and tell us what's going to happen next with this venue and what's next for Hackerspace SG. Thanks, Luther. Okay. Yeah. I don't have any slides because I've been very busy throughout the week. Uh, I mean, uh, our communication is pretty public. Most of you all, I mean, I mean, for you all, all of you who are in the community, you probably know that uh, by the 14th of November, our list is going to end and we have to move away. Yeah, we can't exactly uh, pay the rent because, uh, and then there's only also a post of other reasons. So we will be moving somewhere. Where is it? We don't know at the moment. We, I mean, this past few weeks, um, uh, myself and other members, we have been uh, doing uh, a lot of uh, recce site visits, calling property agents, uh, taking video tours, taking pictures of sites that we think that Hackerspace can actually um, have a new home. And uh, yeah, so, I mean, there are some interesting possibilities. It could be another shop house. Today, some of us visited a unit that's in an industrial estate in Taiseng, but it has a, um, it's access to a swimming pool and a gym, just like right at the doorstep. Okay? Um, if you are keen to find out more, follow our social media on our Facebook page and our Google group. Okay? All the details are there. We have, are pretty public about our discussions. Okay? Um, and uh, if you would like, there will be some announcement about official like fundraising. If you want to contribute a small token now, just go to the fridge, grab a beer, and drop four dollars in your tip jar. It's very simple. Okay. Um, does anybody have any burning questions about hackerspace that I can address right now? Yeah. Oh yo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought you were. Right. Yeah. Bad timing, huh? Bad yeah, bad timing, bad timing. <laughs> okay. Um, then the other thing uh, John asked me to talk about, which I'm currently not that keen to talk about, is uh, my current like little like venture with Fuzzly. It's called Twelve Geeks. Uh, the website is twelvegeeks.com, and uh, I mean because I think the Raspberry Jam should be very very common for this. So I'm just going to simply say that it's a shop that sells Raspberry Pis, Arduinos. Okay. Um, it's a, an alternative in Singapore and we don't just want it to be an e-shop um, we want to grow it bigger uh, and we are we are we are e-shop now we are trying to grow it to be um, more you know maker oriented I mean right now you go to most e-shops it's uh, just product oriented but we want to do something that's more maker oriented we want to provide um, an easy channel distribution for people who want to create their own kits who wants to you know um, make their own little projects um, and have a way to monetize their own uh, creations. And in the end, we hope to elevate Singapore as a whole in terms of hardware and interest uh, in the maker culture. Yeah, so, yes. Can you come talk to me after? I'd like to talk about that. Yeah, yeah okay. okay, sure. Um, yeah, anybody has any questions? I'll be happy to answer them. If not, I'll be happy to hand over to the next speaker. Okay. Hey. I'm going to sit up here quickly. Is this long enough? Okay. Just on, on what Luther said, um, with regards to Raspberry Pi and this meetup, it's a lot. It's probably the last meetup here at this venue now, right? Yeah, I think the first one was here. I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so a couple of a couple of things. Um, I brought I brought Raspberry cupcakes. <laughs> they are filled with Raspberry Jam at the Raspberry Jam. <laughs> So help yourself, please, whenever you feel like it. And, and just before we eat, 
Mm. Are you the one making them? <laughs> no, this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the cheesecake from the previous one I made, but this one I didn't know. Well, that's not. why I got sick. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be posting up the recipe on this website, PiSG, and um, help yourselves. Just as a courtesy towards Girl Geeks, I would like to sponsor this as a small fundraising event for this meetup. If you want to, if you can add two dollars to the tip jar for every cupcake you take, at least. Or you can do more if you want to, I don't mind. I'm not going to stop you. Okay? Yeah, for for uh, hackerspace. Right? For hackerspace, yeah. So we can do that. Welcome, guys. I see we're a full house. Wow. Alright, now, next up, I'm talking about this website. I'm working on a project at the moment, it's called PiSG. Thank you, Adnan. I don't see him here no, for the short form. Basically, just to show you very quickly, is. Wow! Whoa. Uh, raspberry flavor. What happened there? You hit yeah. it. Okay, there we go. No, no, I go. <laughs> that's okay, not moving. That's what it should look like. All right, now this website, because when we work on the Facebook group, a lot of times the posts get shoved down very, very quickly because everyone is extremely enthusiastic about this little machine. So I got frustrated trying to look for links and tutorials all the time that people have shared previously. I've got a photographic memory, but Facebook does not. <laughs> so I started this up in order to not only keep track of the events, uh, but also, also recipes which basically includes your projects. Last Raspberry Jam, as you can see, or there was a little bit of a write-up and pictures that were shared by that one. So we'll be keeping track of our happenings as well. And under recipes, you'll be able to see this. As just to show you, this website actually runs from my Raspberry Pi at home. Yes, at the moment it's a <coughs> lamp server. This is a tutorial on how it was set up. It loads fairly quickly because there's not as much traffic at the moment, so it's. It can handle it at the moment. You can fix that. Yeah, you can fix that. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, Luther said he was going to challenge me. Yeah, yeah we can test for you. On that one. What's, yeah. what's the um, next up for this <laughs> website, I've got a lot of tweaking to do in terms of optimization. Mike suggested that I run an, on an engine, Nginx server rather than Apache. So that's the next thing I'm going to do. And so, any. Anyway, she suggested that I change my permalinks to words at the top. My issue at the moment is that I can't, I can't change it without breaking the website. Mm. Unfortunately, if I go <coughs> to oh, permalinks, if I go to permalinks and I choose post name, which would be the preferable one for SEO, then what happens is. I can revisit the site because the main link will still work. The port forwarding still works and then DNS, but whenever I click on any other link, existing link, then it breaks the links to that. So I will either have to create some sort of forward to the old links or I must rebuild the server from scratch because when you work with WordPress, you have to remember if you want to change the permalinks. You have to set it up correctly from the beginning. It's but I didn't know that. It's a, a HD access file. It's a file that it writes to HD the access uh, file I worked on. Uh, yeah. If you look at this one, you can edit it here. Uh, but I don't know what code to use. No worries. We, we can take this offline. I have the HD access pro. Yeah. Okay, at this point, the other thing I still have to do is to automate the registration. Um, everyone that registers, I have to email them their password manually. So, but for that, I will have to put up a post, post fix or some sort of email server. That's coming up next, and eventually, I'm hoping to actually build up this website to be used for the community. 
the default registration if you want to register is author, which means you can create and edit your own posts, but not anyone else's. So I'm hoping to see a bit more involvement from the community as well to create our own projects and posts and everything. I will create another category as per Benoit's request for projects specifically. And then we can work on that one and also see maybe if we can get people to uh, plug in together and work together on uh, to see if they can find people who wants to work together on projects. So that's version two. All right. So that's that's PySG. If anyone has any questions or suggestions, that's more than welcome. No? Yeah. Well, uh, my suggestion is to run something more lightweight. <laughs> yeah. That I've could got be for Nginx. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm running Nginx here and stuff. You can make but it, you, uh, I would say a Py is, is perfectly capable of running at a normal website. Yes. That's what I'm attempting to do, yeah. <laughs> but that, that's not normal, well, I guess that's it is normal. But that, I, I wouldn't call WordPress and MySQL that normal because it's quite heavy. Uh -huh. Like a static website. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, for me, I chose WordPress because the management makes it quite easy. Yeah. Uh, multiple users. Yeah, and they use WordPress. Especially if you have a lot of people, uh, if you're expecting a lot of people to contribute to content. Well. I, I always like Git. If, if people can't use Git, then it's not a friend. But you married someone who can't use Git. Oh! oh. 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 Okay. So the Japanese you can use that. I got a, I got in that GitHub file. So I'm actually using it. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll talk to you later about that. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I will, I will keep you guys posted and you can keep visiting the site to see the progress. All right, next up we've got Johan. Is he one here? Johan, John. He said he was going to speak about Jellyfish and running, controlling appliances from Twitter through the Raspberry Pi. Is he here? Looks like he hasn't made it here yet. We'll keep him for later. Then, Tiny. Is Tiny here? Tiny is not Tiny's here yet either. It's pretty big. <laughs> My God. So he was supposed to. <laughs> yeah, he was supposed to. His project, Maria, is growing with the Raspberry Jams. Because he said he's come up with Maria 2.0 now. So we'll be waiting for him. Next up, then Shafiq. You said you're going to. Plug it? Sure. Yeah, it's here. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I keep it here because... Okay. Sorry. No, I just use the HTML box to the Is it HTML space? Uh, oh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's why I was not very keen to leave it on the And we are live. Yes! <laughs> Well, that's what John named it. Uh, I think you got the screens confused. <laughs> you can turn on screen mirroring and that will show you. Or so I just remove the page of the screen. Oh, you can do it from here. I don't 
So anyway, what uh, John wanted me to do was share uh, what I did. And John actually entitled it the Office Project Show, so I'll just do that. Any is actually a 3D printer and Pi being Pi. Uh, okay, thanks. So that's any. Actually, it's a Red Red Pro, supposedly with three extruders. Uh, but it's not working too well with three extruders. The, the X axis is a little bit heavy and stuff like that. So currently, I just use it with one extruder. Uh, other than that, nothing else <coughs> interesting there. Does anybody have any questions about any? <laughs> How much is that? Uh, I bought it in parts. So altogether, it probably cost me, including GST, was about 1500 The cost was mostly in putting it together which is time and skills that I didn't have and just learning all of it. Uh, so the parts is 1,500? Yes. Just the parts? Yeah. Wow. Heated For a bed. Rap rap. Yeah, with a heated bed and everything. I actually got conned on GST. I ended up paying GST for things that <laughs> weren't even there. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Anyway, uh, I won't be sharing very like, it won't be as technical as what you all were sharing because I don't really know the technical stuff. Uh, what I did with this was basically learned a lot of it from the net and then uh, put it in, as in put the code in and I can't really remember what the codes were la. There was just a lot of pseudo DD and all these <laughs> style of things which was quite confusing to me at that point in time, you know So if you go to the next one, you can see some of the first, Okay, next one Some of the frustrating moments that were there That was the setup at home, the one on the left So at home, I was all set up properly on the what, how many in screen and all that but it was still a little bit difficult, especially the part where getting the Wi-Fi network to to work uh, because there was just not enough power to the Pi and then all that nonsense and I had to get a powered, a USB powered hub which was, it might seem obvious to you but it didn't seem obvious to me at that point in time uh. and then you move into the office and I had to work on this small little screen that was just lying around in the office and it was quite frustrating also um, but connecting to the Wi-Fi network in the office was a whole other issue as compared to connecting to whatever was it was in the home. I didn't really know much about the office Wi-Fi network, whether it was WEP or WPA or whatever it was. Uh. So I think I spent most of... So I started working on this probably about 5 plus at after office hours type of thing. And then I went, ended up going home 11 plus all frustrated saying ah fuck this shit and that shit and all this nonsense and then I went off the next day I came back and it was miraculously working pardon the French by the way so that's that uh, the next one it's not French pardon the English <laughs> so early on on the big screen this was the type of things that I was getting because there wasn't enough power to run the whole thing so it was all this cannot execute hardware whatever that thing it might mean something to some of you it doesn't mean anything to me at that it, it didn't mean anything at that point in time until I had to go on and research it I can't really remember how I got past all of this but most of it was just power issues uh, I think anyway moving on and then you get so uh, frustrated that you just type in strawberry and see what happens whether it gets offended or not yes and after a while in the office working on it there was holy matrimony so it started working and if you go to the next one you actually can see a video I hope the voiceover is not there yeah. oh, was that in French as well? <laughs> that's in Tamil actually <laughs> That, that's the sound of the axis moving. <laughs> <laughs> We're not moving? It's alive. It just moved and then you can see it stop at the last point. It's not. Uh, there isn't a video of me actually printing, sending a print to it. Uh, right now I don't do much printing with the rep rep. But yeah. So in the video when it moves, there is this loud. <gasps> it's working! That's me at night. Lah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the more interesting part for me was uh, the whole lot of things that I learned with building the 3D printer and with uh, doing the whole Raspberry Pi experiment. Uh, basically, what it taught me is that 
I re- you really <coughs> just have to put your mind to it and you can do a lot of things uh. so what's next is you get a little bit more you know ambitious with the next few things uh, firstly I want to learn the programming stuff so there's this uh, nice little project called baking pie that I saw and uh, yeah and then there's this group of people that I can get help from now moving on uh, this one so the the company that I run is involved in 3D printing and a uh, little bit of 3D scanning and stuff like that. And uh, most of our business now is based on retail, but I want to move on from that. So we're trying to go and do work with overseas partners and go into 3D scanning. So what I'm trying to build is a 3D scanning rig. Is this? Uh, it's called Open Scan actually. The guy has already built it, and I'm in touch with him to see what type of uh, what type of parts did he use and stuff like that. So it's basically a mechanized. No, it's basically a mechanized, a small little mechanized lazy Susan with a with a rig that moves with a rig for his uh, neck that moves up and down, and it's all Arduino controlled. So, kind of cool. Yeah, the open scan project. If you want, it's a scan with a K. If you want, just go up and look it. Go and look it up. Sorry. Ah, and then there's this, which apparently is also Raspberry Pi controlled, as in the button pro. Some cool stuff going on. <laughs> Yeah, and they have released all their. That's true. Because we're still working on Python. Yeah, we have one. Is that not a Python project on the, on the Pi? It's a Python project on the Pi. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
And when John said come and share, I thought, okay then. So a nice chance to show off. Anything else? How fast is the printing? How fast is it? So what's an issue in the... In the yeah, at, for the rep rep, I print really slow so that you get good quality print. So it's about 60mm or something per second type of thing. It's like really slow or 50mm or something like that. But on the replicator 2 that I have, I print a little bit faster. It's about 120 on the replicator 2. Uh, the Red Red Pro's got something going on now, like a 0.3 mm extruders, uh, 0.3 mm extruders coming as in, in the mail somewhere, lost. So when that comes about, hopefully the prints get a little bit more better quality. But 3D printing is fun, man. You just get a lot of nonsense out. <laughs> really. Yesterday I was sitting down printing bottle openers for ourselves and stuff like that, yeah. Anyway. Anything else? <laughs> Thank you very much. I might say, for someone who says they don't have any programming experience, that is a hugely ambitious project to start with. But it's in the spirit of Raspberry Pi, we know that by doing we learn, and that is how I think almost all of us got started. Next up, we've got Matthew, he's going to speak oh, to us and tell us. Yes, while he's set up, I'll just tell you, he said he's going to share with us how he's running a Raspberry Pi emulator on Crude. And uh, the other thing I wanted to share is for the website and for the and for the community, I printed these stickers if you want to use them. You can just share. I'm sure. I'm sure you guys would like to have some. And just pass that on. Pigs. Pigs. Yeah. Yeah, it's pigs. <laughs> okay. We are pigs. So uh, come to see us if you want to print t-shirts. We can uh, we can cut. Uh, it's a very low, simple logo to cut. So we you can come bring your laptop and you can uh, cut the artwork and press. I have everything at work. I have uh, <laughs> everything to make t-shirts, everything to make stickers, everything to make uh, the signage. Uh, it's my little playground. Uh, yeah, and I can print 52 inch wide. Yeah. I guess that that is interesting. Because I remember um, in like June, July, Adnan was like trying very hard to get it up to the, the, the mods for I can see it. He's here with us. I don't know. Okay, let's start. I think this guy. You think you can do the the press button for me, or yeah, I can. Okay. So I'm ready if everyone is. So let's start. So um, I hosted the second Raspberry Pi meeting uh, at my company, and I presented. Um, a way to uh, emulate a Raspberry, uh, sorry, compile uh, under Linux for your Raspberry. <coughs> so a cross-compiling emulator, uh, take me a lot of time to set up. Once it's set up, you need to set up uh, in your script a lot of variables so that you explain to your scripts what uh, cross-compiling you have to use. Uh, it was a little bit boring, take me some time. If I forgot things, I need to go back. So I decided to try to compile on Raspberry. Compiling on Raspberry is super slow. I don't know if you try it guys, but for me it's super slow. So today I'm going to present um, how to compile on your Raspberry, but using Linux, meaning that if you don't have Raspberry, you still can uh, install a Raspberry uh, system and compile on it. Yeah, thank you. So um, we, are using, we are going to use QEMU, QEMU, uh, sorry. So if you don't know what this is, this is uh, basically a virtual uh, host machine, a virtual machine, sorry, that is uh, uh, running on your host. 
So um, I like Linux, so I'm running it on Linux, and you can run uh, multiple QMU on top of Linux. One is using, for example, Red Hat, uh, Windows, or Debian. It's supporting a lot of processors, and it can run a lot of uh, different operating systems, as long as the processor itself is uh, supported. So is it very different from uh, VMware? Or uh, yes, I, I mean, it's, uh, is it really different? It's the same concept, however, VMware can't simulate processors. <coughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, that's it. So that's also why I choose it for, uh, for, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, sorry, for the emulation, because it does uh, emulate uh, IRM 1176, which is the one that we have in the Raspberry Pi. So, yep. So we're also using, uh, so I'm using CH root, why? Because I have a quadruple processor and I love compiling on quadruple. It's way much faster than a single core, which is way much faster than on my Raspberry Pi. So uh, CH root is what I'm, I'm going to use. So what is CH root doing? Basically you have your operating system and you can create uh, like an environment where processor or process or process going to be uh, stuck and they can't exit that. So if you run a process inside your search root, they are going to see only this part. They won't be able to move up the chain. So Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi, what is important is this is what I want to emulate. I want to emulate an RM processor 1176. That can go. So I want to emulate this little this little thing. So keep in mind that the search root, you won't have GPIO, you won't have uh, all these kind of uh, things dedicated to Raspberry, you're only emulating um, um, sorry, a CPU and you're running compilation on top of that. You can still have a screen and things, but that's what you're looking for. So that's my Raspberry. If I look at the speed, I get about uh, 700 uh, MIPS. That's on my computer. When I use only QMU, I end up with uh, below 600. So basically, if I compile on my Raspberry Pi, it's faster than on my, si on my uh, Linux uh, uh, systems, despite I have a 4-core, 3.2 uh, gigahertz uh, <laughs> CPU. So I say, like, OK, why the hell I have that? So I try to have a look around, and I say, OK, let's recompile QMU, because per default, uh, at least in, in Debian, because I'm a Debian user, um, the, um, the binary for QMU uh, do not emulate the proper IRM 1176. So, um, I, uh, yeah. so I, I have to, I compile it myself, that's the, um, the command line, and I made it static. I will explain later on why I made it static. Uh, sorry, why I, I have these lines of code and stuff, it's because if you take my presentation, basically you copy paste and you should be able to run the CH root environment. So that's why it's in a little bit of code, but uh, I prefer to have it like that, and people came back to me, especially because I break my blog. Come and say, oh, okay, how you do that? So that's why uh, everything is written here. So you do, and you have a Mac, and you have a nice binary that is uh, able to emulate the RM 1176, so the exactly the CPU from uh, the Raspberry Pi, and it's static because we will need it later. Yeah. <coughs> so um, how you do? Do you set up your environment? You don't know the Raspbian. I'm a Raspbian user. And people like it or not. Uh, you don't know the emulator, you run this command line, so what I'm saying to, the, to a, my QMU system, I think you run this kernel with this um, CPU, and you start uh, in a single, um, so one single user, so meaning that nothing is mounted. so later on I can do the magic. Why are you gonna have to do that? Because per default, if you don't know, don't know the image from a Raspbian, you cannot uh, connect to it. There is a loop, infinite loop, so maybe they fix it, but there is an infinite loop. And second, yeah, I'm going to have to change for, I'm going to have to change here the, um, the access to the different partitions. So later, later on, I, have to, I do have real access to this partition. So we're going to make it fast. You copy that, you paste that, it works. Now you have a Raspberry Pi image that can boot uh, under QMU. So now that uh, it boots, I say, OK, Raspberry, uh, Raspbian sorry, image is very, very small, uh, about uh, 800 megs uh, total of, uh, of um, disk or something like that. Sorry? About 400. 500. 400, yeah, OK. So it's even worse than what I thought. Um, when you start compiling, like any compiler, you're going to have to download libraries. You're going to have to compile stuff. You're going to have to get basically a lot of things on your partition. So what I did is I just 
upload the size, uh, upgrade the size of, sorry, um, increase the size of my partition, and sorry for my French, because yes, yeah. I do have French. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is, the, it won't be needed when you do a CH root later on, but just in case you need one day, because you don't want to do CH uh, root for any reason, but you want to have a big partition, that's what you're going to have to do. Yeah. You start that, uh, so with the image you download and the new one, you, uh, so the six gigs you just created, uh, you delete the second partition, you create a partition with a new space, you do the minimal uh, minimum checkup for, so that uh, the uh, uh, partition file system know that it's now a big uh, a bigger than uh, expected uh, partition, and you restart from here. And here you have a kernel, uh, sorry, you have a QMU running a Raspberry Pi with six, gig, six gigs of um, of space on your on your image. So we see way much better. But still, we have this problem that when you compile, it's uh, slower than a real Raspberry. So that's when I go for CH root. Okay, so that's where the magic, uh, which is magic because uh, first I didn't really know what happened, but that's that's how it works. So you get your image, that the one you know, remember I fix it so that we don't have the loop when uh, we start it. Um, I look at uh, the content of it, I have two partitions. So what I want to do, I want to, um, I want to map the first part, to mount, sorry, the first partition so the, the second partition here, and I want to map these three things because I really, uh, that's minimum. Uh, that's the minimum of things you need for, for uh, Linux to be able to work. I mean, yeah, slash uh, prox, uh, slash dev, and slash this makes sense to have it. Um, do not forget to copy QMU RM, the binary we just compiled. You have to copy it inside uh, the source mount. Uh, sorry, mount. TMP slash USR slash bin if on your uh, host uh, it's on slash USR slash bin. If you copy it on uh, slash home slash uh, M, it has to be on the Raspberry Pi on slash host slash M. It has to be exact same space, same uh, uh, directory. Don't ask, me, don't ask me why, I have no idea. If you don't put that here, it's not working. <laughs> so I just copy uh, paste it here. Um, <coughs> so now we have a QMU. Remember, I copied it static because like that, there is no dependence to other libraries. So by itself, it works. And that's cool because as I'm moving it to another system, so my uh, ra emulated Raspberry, it has to work by itself. If not, I will have to install a lot of stuff and it's complicated, so make it static. So once you have that, you're going to have to explain to your system how to run ARM uh, binaries, because we are emulating Raspberry, uh, Raspberry is, turn, is running on um, ARM, so it's ARM binaries. So what you do, you create this file and you say, okay, when you see an executable file, so exec file ELF this, which is the one for, um, for ARM, uh, sorry, ARM binary, you're going to run this command. And that's... Uh, yeah, sorry. I mean, once you have created that, uh, I'm on the Debian. I have to run this command two times. Yes, there is a bug. Uh, Debian is aware of it. They never fix it. So you run the command two times. Two times is going to tell you it's okay. But the first time, it not, do not work. So if you don't run it two times, you're going to wonder why it's not working. There's a bug. They are aware of it. And it's like that. So yeah, we can go to the next one, if I'm correct. Yeah, so what do you have now? So, we have um, an image that we are mounted. We have uh, we set up QMU and we explain to QMU how to run when you see an ARM binary and what to run. So this QMU um, uh, uh, minus ARM minus the uh, static. So how you run your chroot? Okay, I'm not an administrator, so I do sudo chroot mnt, and that you good. You are on your emulator. How you can verify it? You just uh, you name minus a, and you can clearly see that we are emulating the correct um, uh, the correct processor, and we are running on my Linux box uh, on this uh, emulator for Raspberry Pi. So once you do that, if you do a make, if you have four cores like me, you do make minus g4, and it's compiled on four core, which is way much faster than uh, the Raspberry itself. And so, again, a lot of code that I go fast on it, but you copy, paste, basically it's going to work um, for you. So that's my presentation. Hope you like. So if you have any, any questions, questions, comments, comments. So, so this is useful if, for example, if one wants to compile 
It's a, a large application. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I will get the binary, but to actually execute, it will not. It will. It will actually execute also. It's compiled. Oui, it's compiled. Hey, it's execute. You yeah. can, you can run it. So, but the output will have. Uh, how do I get the, let's say some uh, GPU, OpenGL? Um, uh, I see it as only a, a compiled system. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I, um, I compile a lot of uh, game simulators, and some of them take uh, six or seven. I mean, like a stack takes six or seven hours to compile minimum on my uh, on my Raspberry Pi. When it takes about an hour or top uh, to compile here. So now I have a script. I just run the script. It compiles everything by itself. It downloads the, lib the needy libraries. Um, that's, that's how I use it. I know that uh, by basically by using that, if there is a display to be set on screen, it will it should work. I never tried, okay. but um, I have seen people running Windows app natively under uh, Linux as soon as, as long as they explain to the system when they see an ELF, so uh, uh, Windows executable, which QEMU to run. So it does work. And there are a lot of uh, videos on the internet. This guy has a Windows and launch uh, MS Word. How does this compare to the cross compilation? Um, as, I, uh, as I explained, I did cross compilation a long time ago, and my, at least the way I do it, I have to set up uh, some variables and stuff before doing the cross compiling. And I, I must not forget them first, and from time to time, the make, uh, the make or the config? config file. I think the configuration is like overwriting some of them. You don't. That's really, uh, you are under your Raspberry, so you, you type configure, and that's it. Okay. You know it's an RM, you do not have to set up anything, you just uh, run the, con the configure as it was written by the developer. So for example, for this simulation system, just uh, configure, make, make install, you go. So um, how is it? I mean, yeah, the difference is here. I don't have to set up a lot of stuff. I'm already on the, not on the physical board, but on an exact copy of this physical yeah. board. But it, it's also that you're compiling an environment that is the deploy environment as well. Yeah. So you can directly test and do QA on, on the application as it compiles or configures. <coughs> yeah, but uh, the, uh, yes, this, but this idea of compiling, I don't need to set up anything. I'm already on the box itself. So, mm -hmm. like, there is no magic, there is no, oh yes, yeah, I need to remember that uh, uh, yeah, the GG, uh, GCC, sorry, it should be equal to blah, blah, blah. Don't care, just configure, make, make, and start. Okay. And it's way much faster because the make minus G4 or G8, if you are very close. Yeah. That's cool. Oh, I have a question. I didn't see the details there. Are you, are you building ARM6 soft load packages, uh, binary, sorry, or ARM6H? Or ARM so, uh, sorry, I'm uh, not super good in CPU, what do you mean? Uh, the, the, it's more to do with the, the end binary. Uh, I, I'm not really know what I'm talking about either. Basically, <laughs> 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 no, the, the thing the, 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 for my Arsenix install on my Pi here, it runs ARM6H, which is evidently, which is hard flow, which is... Yeah, it's hard float. If, if the operating system set up as a hard float... But does QMO have hard float support for evolution? Yeah, the, the QMU and the output okay, support then, then for then I guess you can. Oh, okay. That's not a problem. I agree. Uh, so you are building ARM6 hard floats? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm building whatever Raspbian is supporting, and yes, it's supporting hard float per default now since uh, okay. uh, about six months ago. So um, I'm, I'm compiling whatever um, okay, cool. it's compiling per default. So, so one of your, um, your main applications for this is to, let's say, take some yeah. game engine and basically Recompile them onto the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, because it's take uh, it's get a freaking long time. There is a how can it? They call it RetroPi. If you try to compile RetroPi on a Raspberry Pi, it takes about sixteen hours, twelve to sixteen hours. Uh, honestly, I have other things to do, <laughs> and some of the uh, of uh, some of what they compile, they forgot some options because it takes huge time to compile. My system, I don't care about having all these extra libraries with uh, I don't know like. With uh, OpenGL, <coughs> with uh, ESGL, whatever. I don't care because it's fast, and it's on my laptop. I mean, it's on my main computer. I do a screen. I let it run, and so imagine currently it's on my computer, but it's able to run on my Synology. I just need to compile QMU for Synology, and I'm up and running. So I'm done. Your Amazon uh, Web Services or any uh, cloud system, as long as you compile QMU. The rest of it is here, the, the, the search route, everyone have it. 
So as long as you're able to play a role, so it's compiled to QMU on the system that is up and running all the time, you're set to do it. Thank you. So I have a Thank question you. for you Thank with you. the uh, Raspberry Pi website. All of these are going to be on there, right? So, uh, yes, uh, are, are we able to, to uh, okay. uh, okay. uh, are we able to emulate a more feature-rich processor to QEMU? Yeah, um, there's a list of 70 processors it emulates or something. But like it that. emulates both ways, right? Like on uh, ARM, you can emulate yeah. a Intel. Oh. So, like. Yeah, I yeah. understand yeah, emulating yeah. down, but yeah. emulating yeah, yeah, yeah. up. Yeah, QM, QMU, basically, it's a, okay, to make it simple, it's a text file, and tell him when, uh, so the executable asks for this um, uh, this interruption, uh, processor yeah, yeah. interruption, you run this on the main on the main system. There is uh, There are files for doing both. Okay. So, as long as QMU runs on your system, your system is able to run anything. <laughs> Just, you're gonna have, you need to have a fast, CPU to emulate a small CPU. You can't do a small CPU to emulate a, a very fast CPU. Yeah. No, but you emulate an XAZ on ARM is just going to be super slow. Yeah. It's going to be slow, but you're not going to be restricted in terms of speed. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
But uh, what I'm gonna, uh, one of the projects that I did uh, this week was also to run Google Coder, which is based on Raspbian, but it is basically for uh, people to <laughs> learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I'm a web developer, and Lakshan, my web developer friend, was like poking me in Twitter, hey, run Google Coder. So what I did, I took an SD card, and I kind of installed it here. And I did not have a Wi-Fi module, like I said. So there is this lovely blog post on how to set up a static IP address on your Raspberry Pi. So let me just show you very quickly how I did it. So my Raspberry Pi's IP address is 192.168.2.2. And I basically went to this file, so sudo nano and this file, and I changed uh, the config settings according to this blog post. And it basically looked a little bit like this. So I also took pictures. So I, I kept this. And uh, this is where you see I'm connecting to my MacBook with an IP address of 2.1. And how do you set your IP address manually in your MacBook? You go to your Ethernet, and here you see I have set it up manually, 2.1. Okay, so all I'm gonna do is um, basically have the Raspberry Pi Ethernet uh, connect up, um, no power external. So I'm gonna uh, connect up this, and then the Ethernet to here. All right, and um, on my MacBook, the last thing I did was also to change the host files. Of course, you can go to your browser and access this uh, directly. So let's see whether it works. <laughs> oh. oh, it's working, okay, awesome. And uh, now all you need to do is go here, quarter.local or 198. blah blah. Come on, don't fail me. There you go. Woo! <laughs> and, uh, and let's code. And uh, so these are the default ones. You can play a little game here. S start game and choo 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 choo. <laughs> whatever. I'm, I'm not a gamer, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but most importantly, you can come here, name it uh, Rack. Jam 6, choose a color, create, and uh, basically there's a code here and you can you are able to kind of um, view it right here. Hello world. No? And save it and it will basically come up here. So I thought that since no Wi-Fi is required, you can basically take this Raspberry Pi to a village and then hook it up to a kid's laptop and teach them HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So that was my first week in Raspberry Pi. Thank you. Sorry? Yeah, I know, but I did not have it. Don't disconnect it. Sorry? Don't disconnect it. Don't disconnect? Yeah. Oh, you have questions? <laughs> no! <laughs> yes. Um, one, one thing you can try, yes. without even fixing a static IP address, sure. just try calling the Pi. Using Raspbian, you can use the name of the Pi dot local, so, uh -huh. and you should be able to get to it. Right? So if it's my Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. if, if, if you set up the name as my Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. with Raspbian, you can get it at my Raspberry Pi dot local. You should be able to get to it now. Okay. And if you can't, if you install a Vahi, you will definitely be able to do that. Okay. If you've got Arch Linux, uh -huh. uh, when you install Arch, um, with the latest version on the, on the Raspberry site, you put it in and then you update it. And whatever the name of the Pi is, you can access it by the name. So if you call it, um, the default name is Alarm Pi, so you just you can just ping Alarm Pi and it works. Okay. Okay. Another thing uh, yes. is, instead of setting up a static IP, you can also enable internet sharing. If you enable internet sharing on your Mac mm -hmm. or your Linux box, whatever you're using, then you can share your Wi-Fi connection over Ethernet yeah. to yeah. your Pi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what th what happens then is that your laptop always gets 192.168.2.1, yeah. and the first device gets 2.2. Okay. Okay. Any other suggestions for a new B Raspberry Pi user? Well, one thing about Coder, uh, it's got a really old version of Node. So yeah, so update it. It's point six. Zero so point six or something. Yeah, point six. Unfortunately, uh, Node, uh, I don't think they have Node.js in their app get repositories for uh, Raspberry. 
uh, you might have to get some somebody's compiled version. But uh, be careful because the I think 0 0.6 has a lot of issues. Uh, As security. So do move up to 10.21 or whatever because there were some big security patches in the last two, three versions. It's no JS. It's, a, it's the biggest security loophole there is. <laughs> we can fight all day. <laughs> <laughs> right, hopefully next time I present something more. Any other questions or anything? Nice. Okay, thank you. As you can see there, there was tabs also where you could choose to change the CSS and JavaScript. Yeah. Yeah. Options. So all three uh, files are connected to each other and in that you can create your front end project as well. Alright, Team Swordfish is going to present Maria 2.0. No. She, according to Tiny, she seems to be growing up together with her raspberry jams. So we'll see what they've done since last time. Oh, I need some, I need some, some time to set up. You know, and Joe will have something to present as well. Sure, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the last time uh, my team was here and I was with uh, two other guys, right? The other bow headed guy, and she was my engineer. And there was the other guy yeah. who is my programmer. Asians left to Norway. Yeah, so both of them, under the pressure yeah. of family, one <laughs> left to work for Mindef and one left for Norway. So now left me and art major student to do their work. So <laughs> now it's a little problem, so today you're not going to see very something tacky, okay? Don't expect that. Don't put a pressure on me. <laughs> I'm really nervous now. So, uh, okay, while they set up, do you want to show us the, uh, your new yeah, toy? Yeah, I can, or do you want to go? You're all set uh, up. Yeah. Okay, um, so um, my name is Ben. I I'll need a keyboard, a mouse, uh, HDMI, and power. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, today we, we got lucky. We were uh, amongst the first to get our crate of Udos. Uh, which is a, uh, a quad-core equivalent of a quad-core Raspberry Pi and an Andro Android Due, Arduino Due on one, on a single board. And uh, the, uh, I'm just lucky, it's not like, yay. Uh, uh, the idea is that... Well, use the hub, use the hub. Sorry, the, so you can use the hub. That hurts. There's a hub over there. There's a hub over there, use the hub for the internet. Uh, okay. okay, so the idea is, um, why is this fantastic is that, I'm sure Dave is frustrated about this right now, is that when you're trying to build an embedded system, when you're trying to build something that is meant uh, to work uh, independently, a, a real-time system, embedded system, is that you're mixing both electronics and software. So you're going to be mixing both a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino to get your basic stuff done. Uh, so for example, if you're building a 3D printer, you're going to have to manage both the software, the slicer, the interface on one end, and you're going to have to manage the motor controls and everything else on the other end. So a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino. Uh, to this effect, most 3D printers are Arduino based, well, the cheap ones. Um, so this does just that. So there's a serial interface between the two. So you're able to address the GPIO pins of the Arduino on, uh, on Linux and you're able to push back information from the Arduino to Linux. Um, it has a mega type uh, GPIO pinout so you can use your existing shields and directly uh, interface with your previous projects. Sorry, it's a bit difficult. So you power? Yes. This is nice. What's this? It's just a Apple TV. Oh, okay. It's streaming for Apple TV. So the idea is uh, on this OS which is seven gigs to download. It's really not light. Uh, I was shocked. Um, it requires 12 volts, five amps to run. Five amps. It, it's a real oven. There's a heat sink the size of a deck of cards on it. Um, uh, HDMI? Thank <laughs> you. 
Second. Oh, wait. wait. Um, so the idea is that a, your Raspberry Pi uses 500 milliamps to operate at full capacity. Your Arduino uses about one amp to operate at full capacity. If you're driving anything else, you need additional current or additional load capacity. Uh, five amp really enables you to drive stuff, uh, especially if you're trying to control DC DC convert. Yeah. yeah. It, it starts black for some reason for about 10 <laughs> seconds, and then magic happens. Um, I'll need a mouse. Oh. So um, I won't uh, go too far into things. Uh, ultimately, there's no libraries, there's no API for it yet. It's about two weeks old. Um, the only thing that really is fun is that through the command shell uh, or a terminal, you can address the different G GPIOs. But what's really nice is that out of the bat, you're able to open up the Arduino IDE, create your sketches, program your board, and get something done really, really quickly. So for example, this is a, just a blinky uh, exercise. But the idea is that you can have your Arduino operate. You can shut down your Raspberry Pi or the Linux part and have the Arduino ma maintain alive. So keep alive the Arduino while the Raspberry portion of it is dead. And then you can wake it up through the Arduino. So the idea is that if you're running a real-time system, is that you can go low power mode by only keeping the, uh, the sensors or, or the triggers alive and waking up your system on demand. Uh, uh, yeah, a few hundred milliamps probably, but uh, you know if you're running a, something heavy on your Arduino then it, it goes better, but uh, ultimately is when you're doing pa battery operated uh, machinery uh, and you need for your operations battery you can operate your battery when you don't need it you just go on standby mode um, so essentially it's all there there's almost no package for it uh, no libraries are there yet but you can address uh, basically the GPIOs directly and create your own libraries um, question comments um, if you'd like to play with it I'll leave it here uh, yes um, how is the, the serial bus between the, uh, them? Uh, Say again? The, you said the serial, serial connection between the, uh, yeah. the, the, uh, the mega chip and the... Uh, uh, well, you have to create your own. Okay, so it's it's done on the, the Mega itself. Yeah, yeah, it's done on the Mega itself. You configure a serial interface. You say, uh, these two pins are TX, RX, and then push it back. And then on the other side, you create something like... So it doesn't have, like, some of the Arduinos have another chip that controls the USB conversion and serial to serial on no. the boards. I, well, I, don't, I haven't discovered it yet. So, uh, and also what's nice about this is that it has native support for LVDS. So if you want to use uh, LCD panels without having all the, the VGA or DVI interface around it, uh, you can just connect it directly. It has SATA support. It has a USB to pin. So instead of a socket, it's pinouts. Um, and it has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Okay. For seven gigs, I remember. <laughs> seven gigs, yeah. You have no library, but you have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. <laughs> uh, so the uh, the most expensive is 130 US. Uh, that's for the quad cores. Two cores is 109, and then the two cores without a lot of the connectors, like the the bare bone version, is 89, I think. Uh, yeah, it's ARM, uh, oh shoot, I forgot. Uh, Did you buy from 12 gigs? Huh? <laughs> Did you buy from 12 gigs? No. It's not there, right? Luther! <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you got private requests to stream and stuff, yeah, we can talk privately. There's <laughs> <laughs> one reason why we exist, yeah. But when you got it, we got it on the Kickstarter, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we got a, a crate full. We hoard. Yeah. Oh, it's the IMX6 speaker. Yeah, and there's uh, four and there's uh, three GPUs. Oh.
No, it's fine. No. It is uh, Maria ready? Yeah. Um, He's ready. He's ready? He's all set. Okay, thank you. Oh. So let me check on her a little bit. She doesn't feel so good recently, you know. <laughs> Yeah, teenage years, huh? <laughs> yep. <laughs> She's just being done by previous two engineers, that's right. And I don't think she likes me a lot. <laughs> Do you need to project anything? Do you guys need to... No? Do I have this? Oh yeah, 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 go for it. What? What? Me? What's your bien? What's nice is that the SD card doesn't stick out. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. But what I was really hoping for is. Oh, sorry. This interface. Oh, now this, this, no. this, this is not my slide, right? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, well, I was they, like, they did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was trying to do this uh, visualizer. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Right, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the Linux distribution. Yeah. Uh, what kind of distribution do you have? Uh, Linux Mint. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so right. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry for the trouble. Sorry for all the hassles. Uh, my name is Tiny, and like I said, I represent a team that Iron I have with one. Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got me. You got me. Okay, so. I am. Yeah, so we actually presented this project once and after it was after Code Extreme. So we went to Code Extreme, we spent 24 hours and this is the project we came up with. And uh, we, we call her Maria and uh, she's actually, I told you she doesn't like me so much. And uh, she's nothing much, we only had an idea of putting a Raspberry Pi and create something to it and something that we really can use it after the competition. So we thought that, you know, what can we possibly use? And then we came up with the idea that says that, um, you know, create our own personal assistance that help to do our work. Just, just a little bit of fun. And so we create Raspberry. <laughs> we use, we leverage on the cloud computing side, you know, the speech to text and text to speech, vice versa. And we create a personal assistant that talks to us. You know, so if we ask, we want to ask information, she fetch it, you know, some common one like weather, the latest news, and our checklist, our appointment. So we also set up a web interface. So we talk to what we set our appointment through the web interface. Three. Is it this one? With IP. Oh. Five. So yeah, so we program it and every time we just need to ask, like, Maria, what is the time now? Maria, what is the weather? Maria, what is the latest news? Etc. Those simple stuff that we really use it every day, but you know, we just we just want to make it a little bit geeky way. Not not my idea anyway. So I'm not <laughs> one one dot fifty seven. No, five dot fifty seven. Five dot fifty seven. So I don't know whether does she work now? Uh let me try, let me try. Okay. Maria, what is the time? Siri. No. <laughs> the time is 6.30 p.m. Oh, yeah. Like, the first thing she learned to do. Okay, is to tell us <laughs> what is the time. <laughs> really? The first thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's, not, it's not right, right? No. Okay. All right. Okay. The time. 
This isn't Dubai. All oh, right, no, I, I got it. I got it. Let me try it again. Okay, let me try the weather. I, I get, I get confident that she can do pretty, you know. Uh, what is the weather now? The weather is mostly cloudy. <laughs> no? Okay, that's bad, that's bad. No, fetch the news, okay? This one you can verify now, right? Cannot cheat, okay? Please, please. What is the latest news? Come on, please. Fetching latest headlines. Come on, come on, From do it. Straits Times, Hawaii murder. Singaporean victim died of multiple gunshot wounds. Come on, check it out, check it out. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Alright, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Alright. Uh, really? I mean, she actually fetched the headlines from Google News, actually. So, I, I believe it was still, it's still there. I'm pretty sure. It's from the island speed. All the weather, all the thing. And the time is because I used the Python, you know, so I think it needs to run sometime before it gets the update. Right? And, uh, uh, well, okay, uh, tell, uh, let's say, okay. Uh, tell me a joke. <laughs> if the government shuts down, then nothing will get done, just like before. <laughs> okay, okay, I can promise you that these are not hard coded, okay? <laughs> I, I, I am not that cheap, okay? I'm not even. Give me a quote from somebody. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> quote somebody. Sorry, I don't understand. Alright, she, she doesn't do it. Okay, so fine. Okay. So, beside that, you see, this is our web, this is the Maria interface. <coughs> Okay, this is how we set our checklist and set our reminder alarm. So we set it through here, access to this IP if you're running all, all the time at our office. Not our office, our desk. So if I am outside, that I know that she's <coughs> online and I say I want to talk to my teammate at one time. So I know, <coughs> you know, I can just send a message to Maria. Let me try it. message from Tiny. Yeah. Hello world. So we actually set up, you know, like, like, like right now it's my Mac as a server. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> come down, Mara. Come down, Mara. So, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. So, these are, we just put some common things here and there. A little bit of Python scripts here and there. A little bit of scrapping from the RSS feed, you know, a little bit. The, you know, just and putting it together and just use it as just, just for fun, maybe. And there's one thing also, we also hack it to um, connect, connect the Maria with some electronics. So, for example, uh, is it on? Light on? Yeah, so she turned on the light. Oh, sorry, you see <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. Because this is actually, we hack it off from shelf. All right, it's easy. You know, LO, you can do it the same. But also, we recently got one that we really want to start playing with it, is we got uh, the Raspberry with a Z. So, uh, anyone know about the home automation protocol? You know, there are many two, right? One, Zingbee, which more of you know. But Zingbee comes with many profiles, clean energy, uh, biotech, etc. And one that's being dominant and being common use in the home automation protocol operate at a different frequency. It's about, in Singapore, it's about 988. It's called Z-Wave. So, uh, there is a Z-Wave daughter card, which uh, we left it in our, sorry, we were in a mess. So, we left it in our office. It's actually just this small. It's expensive because Z-Wave is proprietary. But if you, it's a daughter card, you put it on the Raspberry, and you can actually communicate two ways with Z-Wave devices. 
So we actually buy a few uh, Z-Wave uh, sockets and you know we put it in and we just talk to it. So we control, for example, we can dim the light, we can turn on and off the fan, etc. So yeah, this is what Maria can do. So put what I mean is this just anybody or over and anybody here can do. It's just customize your Raspberry Pi to help you in your in your life the way you want it. Right. Somebody set it up as a web server, somebody set it up I don't know to play games. But that's just something that we find fun to do. And this this will be all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I don't you know. <laughs> Contributing? Sorry? Uh, to contribute to the product, uh, project, is it uh, open source? Oh, uh, we, we right now, okay, we spent actually the previous one month to actually work on the back end mm -hmm. because when we code for the competitions, we don't care, right? Yeah. Everything just throw, throw in like that. <laughs> if else, whatever, okay, works, good. And we spent a month working on the back end, making everything modular. Mm -hmm. And right now, we also implement with the offline speech engine, which is uh, fix, pocket fix. So we want to make sure that even if it is offline, it can still perform tasks. For example, turn on and off the appliances, which you know you should be able to do whether online or offline. So this is what we do as well. We make everything modular, and uh, we promise that when it is time and it's ready, we will open source it for sure. Because we got everything from the open community. There's no way we keep it to ourselves. That's just wrong. Yeah. So that, that will, will, you know, I promise that will, that will be open source for sure. What offline speech engine are you using? Uh, pocket fix from a CMU fix. All right, pocket fix. It's it is free. Yeah. Yeah. Speech detects. It's a speech recognition. So it de detects your speech, analyzes it, and it comes with uh, a training acoustic model. We call it. Mm -hmm. So the more you talk, the more you train, it actually analyzes your accents, analyzes how you speak it, and actually fits to your style. But is it a supervised uh, learning or, or do you Sorry, need to tell it? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Exit. Sorry. <laughs> Come on, why do it to me now? Today. I Okay, sorry, she's being a bit naughty now. Okay, what, what, what was the question? Yeah, so uh, if you're doing uh, offline speech recognition, do you need to teach it? Your That's what you teach her before you actually implement it. Okay. So what what, what we do actually, you can, you can be something really personalized or you look at a bigger picture is something that fits to our Asian accent. You know, right? French accents, English accents, I mean British accents, but it would be, of course, you can make, if you train, train her personally, it would be really just suit you. Okay. But right now, there are many ways to do it. Right now, one way is that we limit down the dictionaries. So between the words, you know, if we, we have like, I don't know, 500 words at the beginning. Now we trim down to the few, like a dictionary of 50, 60 words that we use it every day. So the accuracy will boost up. You know, there are like somewhere you can play around with it. Because okay. right now you actually detect whether is she online or offline, how fast is the connection. So between to choose whether to send it to the cloud base, which is Google, or do it on pocket things. So most of the time when she's connected to internet, she is running online. That's yeah. Google speech uh, they, they call it an API, but actually it's not really an API. It's actually just like how you scrape an XML. You you fetch it using the URL and uh, you know and get it back, get the text back. That's it. Yeah. Um, but I think it is supervised learning. You have to read up. Okay, so you read a. a yeah, but at at, at the beginning you don't need to. You can just plug and play. But then it will be less accurate if you you know. There already a model which is already there. You can just use it. You know, which is British English and then it'll automate American, it. yeah, yeah, the standard, you know, appropriate English. If you say turn on the light, la, and <laughs> probably, uh, it'll be a little bit difficult, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, anybody else? No. Thank you for being kind to me. Thank you. Uh, next up, we've got John. Okay. Yeah, he said he was. He said, "I'm. Um, I'm hoping that's what he's going to do. That he's going to show us what 
um, jelly, jellyfish, and how to work with Twitter, how to automate and control your appliances through Twitter yeah. and the Raspberry Pi. <coughs> like to show you uh, this little toy that I have uh, powered by Raspberry Pi okay so what it does is actually a simple lamp that uh, gets you notified for, on your social networking sites so if you say you have Twitter Facebook email so it <coughs> it plays uh, different colors uh, depending on uh, different accounts so if you say uh, you're busy walking around your house so you can use this to notify you that something's happening on your email Twitter or any social networking sites so this is how it looks or if you have let's say uh, you have Twitter notification. So you just click and let's say if you have an email. Okay, so we just keep repeating or blinking those corresponding lights. So Twitter and Gmail and Twitter and Gmail. And if let's say um, you have Facebook notifications, so you just top up another color. So basically you have three colors from there. Okay, and then <coughs> so jellyfish is uh, just a little toy. At the same time, it, it, you can it has the ability to control your home appliances using your Twitter as well. So I have a lab over here. So if you say you are outside and you want to have a control over your appliances, right? <coughs> so this is my Twitter account. So if you say a uh, lamp on. So speed. So if you say I want to shut it off, right? Sorry about that. Okay, so say lamp off. There you go. And it should be off. Ah yeah. Right. Okay. And then at the same time it is it's it's actually running a web server uh, in the background, it's uh, listening into a socket for any HTTP request. So it has the ability to you, you can control your life using if you have uh, any smart watches as well. So let's say I have, I have my watch here. So from here you can control it as well. And then you can shut it off from your watch. So from your watch, how, what is the communication? Oh, uh, my watch is talking to my phone through Bluetooth. So then the phone actually creates an HTTP request to the server. And so okay. Any questions, suggestions? So which watch are you using? Sorry? Oh uh, yeah, correct. Right. So thank you. Okay, so very lucky. Do you, do you have plan to uh, let's say to control uh, appliances mm -hmm. like uh, with a higher power? Because an LED would be less like a visual message mm -hmm. or a visual view. But if let's say I want to switch uh, something which requires a main, let's say. Like uh, you know, with a relay or something, would you, would you actually be able? Oh to yeah, uh, it, it's just a matter of uh, adding, uh, yeah, turning the GPIO ports into a relay. Then right. yeah, you can. Yeah. So underneath is a for for this is just a hack for of the RS socket as well. So I have a remote control. Then it's it's just a matter of uh, controlling the remote control. So and, and this is on off. Uh, do you have like gradual? Do you actually have? Oh, it's just on off. On off. Okay. Yeah. Can you, can, is it possible to do PWM on the GPIOs? Yeah, yeah, you have to do that. Yeah? Yeah. But it's a bit banging, right? Uh, I haven't tried that. I, I don't think there's a PWM module, so you have to sort of you have bit to bang yourself. So yeah. On off, on off, on off, on off. It's software. Really? I you need you. Okay, okay. I don't think the Raspberry Pi's RGPIO has PWM. 
pick just one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, 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 one pick, I guess. Yeah, one yeah, pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to enable the driver, and then uh, afterwards, I'll try that. Okay. Yeah, usually, it's, it's, used, it's usually to uh, to to, you, to do the contrast of the LCD, let's say. Usually, oh, okay. that's what Can I? Yeah. There's a PW or no? I can't see it. Maybe it's a. Uh, Yeah, there is. Maybe there's one. There's one. Here, this one. Oh, I was looking on the. But you can also get ask I see chip, where you basically poke poke them with the. Yeah. Oh yeah, and then to add up right, if you want to have more feature, so since you are using Twitter, you can actually if let's say you want to automate your appliances, let's say for a certain time, right? Oh. So you can just use this uh, cloud service called IF Triple T. So what it does is it you can trigger a uh, specific uh, events. events from a from a specific event as well. So let's say uh, from your phone, right? You have a date and time over here. Okay. So let's say every day, right? So so let's say. Uh, so every time you're off to the office, you say 9 a.m., right? So create a trigger. And then what happens during that time? So basically, you just post a tweet. That's like the workflow, is it? Oh, yeah, exactly. Okay. So you just post a tweet. <laughs> then you just put that uh, lamp off. Then, okay. there you go. So it means, uh, basically, so every, every 9 in the morning, then you get the the thing can be triggered to people. So yeah. So can, can you spam? Can you make like ten thousands of them? And <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends if you have the oh, time. Okay, okay, yeah. And if Twitter doesn't block you. Oh, ah yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, they just support the uh, smart things as well. Mm. You know the smart things home automations. Mm. It's like a, they call it a smart things hub. So you get all kind of sensors. Oh yeah. You get motion sensors, infrared, uh, the forget your thing sensors. So you can use this to trigger all this as well. Can you repeat if you left your phone behind? So they, they give you a like a like a keychain. So that you want to take care of, and if you want to locate it, you send a there's an app, mm -hmm. so you can ping it. Is it an RFID? Is it? Uh, so so they actually relay. So this go through the cloud. The cloud connect to the hub, and the hub go through the XB. So, but yeah. how big is the keychain? Uh, like this. And then battery power. Yep. Oh yeah. So, give it to your girlfriend on the next day. <laughs> <laughs> That's too obvious. You gotta okay. <laughs> smart, smart way to do it. I'll give it to the mistress to avoid this. <laughs> 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 run, run. <laughs> French, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect from us? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I, I am French too, so. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Awesome. All right, before, I think we've got one last one left. This Michael Singh said he was going to speak to us about iBeacon. I before yeah. he starts, yeah. can someone from that side please pass one of those boxes of cupcakes <laughs> this way? Yeah. I think there's people getting hungry, yeah? Yeah. And yeah. also start <laughs> circulating <laughs> that, yeah. So, iBeacon. Uh, there is a chat Actually, uh, the same page down. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about the speed of the Can you explain again what is this? What is your phone doing? You. Yeah. Uh, okay, is the cup edible? No. No. no? <laughs> so the idea is. I. Uh, so. <laughs> For the guys who are uninitiated to what I think this is, I'll just show you a video and yeah, assess the work. Assess the work. Assess the work. Do it. Footprint. Footprint. Then you assess how you do it. Maybe we can try to do it. You need to do it.
The phones we carry around are pretty smart, but they can be a lot smarter. For example, they can connect to a server in another part of the world, but they have no idea that you're in a kitchen, in a conference room, or shopping at your favorite retail store. They lack micro-location context, but now that's changed with Estimo Beacons. They use new Bluetooth smart technology, supported by all major mobile platforms, including the recently announced iOS 7 with iBeacons. But anywhere in the physical world, they broadcast context and location to all compatible phones and smart devices in range. Phones can now automatically pick up the signal and trigger contextual actions designed by business owners. Customers should enjoy a seamless experience with more information about the products that we use. Photos, videos, reviews, personalized pricing, and even social updates. As they browse through the store, their phones will transition from one item to the next based on their proximity to the display, enhancing the shopping experience every step of the way. Also, business owners can now benefit from quantitative location data on visits and customer feedback, better for business and a better experience for shoppers. Smart retail solutions by Estimo. Pre-order now at Estimo.com. So uh, that's, that's uh, kind of like what uh, iBeacons is about. Basically, it's about micro location within a say a shopping mall. You could walk into the shopping mall and say, "I'm now at the jewelry section or the perfume section or whatever." So to uh, you can actually uh, the protocol is quite straightforward. It's basically using Bluetooth 4.0 LE. Right, uh, Bluetooth uh, low energy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's using the, pro the, the the advertising protocol in Bluetooth 4, right? Uh, so what <coughs> Apple did was to kind of introduce a another yeah, layer. One, Basically, one it's not, not really a la an la another layer. It's more like a protocol. But you pass it this string, and this string represents this, 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 and that. Basically, the important information is first a UUID, which includes uh, like what kind of uh, retail chain you are, you are, you are. Like say you you are a Costco or a uh, or a Metro or whatever, right? And the next thing you do is you pass in information about uh, quick. Okay, there are two layers of information. The major major information, which is a, a number, an integer, and a minor, major and minor. So major could be like my uh, my my retail chain, uh, basically the Starbucks in Raffles City. Right, there'll be a major number. So, like, if I go to Starbucks in City Hall or in Dolby Gods, there'll be another major number you can you can assign to it, right? And then the minor uh, minor uh, digit will be telling you which part of the store you're in. Basically, you're telling them whether you're in the perfume section or jewelry section or whatever, right? And what it does that you basically transfer information. That information will be broadcast from that base station, a Bluetooth, basically a Bluetooth a dongle that that kind of transmits information about. Uh, about which base station you're close to, and you and you all you do is have an application on iOS or Android that kind of receives that information and turns it into something useful. Uh, basically, uh, I'll show you two websites which I've gone to to actually get information about this. So uh, this is the one I went to. How to make I beacon our Raspberry Pi. I'll share these links later on and in in uh, on on the website. So basically, it's quite also using the Blue Z uh, uh, library, which is quite straightforward. Uh, you download the Blue Z library and you compile it on the Pi, and you basically run a, a command to basically uh, basically there's a couple of libraries got installed first. Then you can download Blue Z. I think the current version is 5.10. Uh, I was playing around 5.8. It was okay, but didn't quite work. Well, this tutorial is kind of incomplete because it was using a particular brand of Bluetooth dongle which the one I have wasn't quite compatible with. So I went online again and I found another tutorial which kind of gave me more information. Uh, this one over here. So how to turn your Raspberry Pi into a, an iBeacon, right? So this one comes with a GitHub project so you can download uh, basically the iOS app, basically which you can install into your uh, iPhone. Uh, basically iPhone 5, iPhone 5S and iPad mini that has the Bluetooth uh, LE uh, chip already built into it, right? So it doesn't work with normal Bluetooth. Only LE. Only LE. Only because only LE has the broadcast uh, and uh, receiving. Your Raspberry Pi dongle does also have to be LE. Yeah. Sorry. The Raspberry Pi dongle, Bluetooth dongle for the Raspberry Pi, also needs to be LE. Yes. Okay. So you, yeah. 
So uh, this particular uh, sample I really like because it has, as I say, a GitHub project mm -hmm. which can check out the sample code for iOS as well as a C program which you can run in the Raspberry Pi. So I was, uh, was but the important thing is that you got to you got to create your own UUID. So the UUID that you create, which is a universally uh, unique ID, uh, has to be the same used on your application as well as on the Pi. So in the Raspberry Pi, it's it's uh, it's basically this. You first install the BlueZ, you compile it, you make it, mm -hmm. and you go further down. You basically have to manually turn it on. Uh, basically, uh, bring up the Bluetooth uh, dongle. And the command you use is you issue is this. You basically, after, after compiling the the iBeacon uh, uh, C program, you just pass in the first of all the UID, right? And basically the major number and minor number. So each Raspberry Pi can have a major number and minor number. And you just basically set like major will be one or two or whatever number you set. So basically, in a in a, in a building or in a room like this. Uh, you could sell like two or three of these beacons. Each of them could have the same major number, which is like say number one, right? And so in this part of the room, I can set the minor number being one, and when you're in the pantry, be two, in the library, be three and four, right? So wherever you walk to, it will actually tell you the the the, the, the base that you are closest to. And when in in iOS for in iOS SDK, right? That I begin SDK also can, it also provides you information about whether you are near to the base station. Uh, sorry, they're far near or immediate basically you're in immediate proximity of the base station which is very cool it uses the signal strength of the, of the bluetooth uh, signal strength to basically make uh, kind of calculate your proximity to it but in my test with the raspberry pi i couldn't quite get an accurate reading i could i could get an accurate reading of the base station i'm i am in proximity to but it doesn't tell me whether it's close uh, is far near or immediate uh, it was kind of wonky in, in that sense. I was like, put, I was like, uh, the Raspberry Pi was here with my Bluetooth, and I was like using my phone just on top of it, and it's still showing me far, which is kind of stupid. So, is it maybe a cycle? Yeah, of, of it could be the antenna position. Could be the antenna position. So I, had, I didn't have much time to actually experiment with it. Anyway, I was using the dongle, which wasn't quite what these guys were using. Um, I think uh, Adrian, you found the exact one, the IO gear. Yeah, so uh, maybe I should experiment with that and to just uh, get a sense of how. I also have the I same issue, also saying far. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, not as, I'm, I'm not so sure about this near far thing, how it's going to work because you can have different front ends to the Bluetooth uh, module and you can have a high power antenna and it's going to be more powerful. So it's like you're far and near on the other, you're going to be all over the same all the time. I don't understand. You have to triangulate it. Yeah, no, exactly. Really are. But it's the current concept is not right. concept is just the power, right? How close right. you are. Is. Is the so, access sign yeah. going to be that one? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so you're saying your Raspberry Pi will detect all these beacons everywhere? You can. And, well, but what was the, the use of this? Is well, to get you, a could have, you could have, for example, example, like uh, you have an art gallery. Yeah. An art gallery, you walk through different parts of the art gallery, you have an application that is running in the background and says, oh, you're now near this Picasso oh, painting. Okay. Okay. They give you contextual information about this okay. painting. Who got in though is doing that before? So yeah. The app, the app yeah. has to know what to do when you're right. near one yeah. of these things. So it's not this sort of global brand no, no, saying, no. oh, I know you're over here, so do this thing. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be uh, attached to your application, nice. right? Um, <coughs> although there have been some... If, yeah. if you were a shop, you need to buy a license to have uh, the ID? Or no, you can just generate it yourself. No, it's, it, it's, it's not connected to the cloud, it's internal. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, but a quick question, um, mm -hmm. is it two-way or is it just device and host? It is two-way. It's two-way, uh, so it can be, but Bluetooth LE is two-way. Bluetooth LE is two-way, but yeah. the broadcasting is one-way, so you only know that. So, okay, so, so that so you know that you received the signal. Uh, so once you've done that, you can actually, I, I think in theory what you could do is you can make uh, the phone actually create Correct a connection that. to that particular base station and then do some other action. Because I'd it. like to be able to, when people approach a kiosk, it reacts to yeah. them. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. 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 It's, it's going to help with an ad system. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think we do? We do I'm doing ad system. Yeah. 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 Well, it could, <laughs> it could uh, of course, in lieu of one-to-one uh, -one communication, it could basically say, uh, wake up the app. Yeah. Okay, so wake up the app, send a HTTP uh, call somewhere, and then you basically call back to the to the actual pie yeah, okay. that's over there, and then you can show like an LCD screen. Hello, Michael. You know, like 
<laughs> My phone is around. Yes. yes, so we do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is this uh, limit to the number of slaves that the broadcasting station can detect at any one time? Uh, it, it can detect as many, uh, as long as they are all advertising, you, can, you pick up the one which is closest to you. Uh, can not say yes, but well, no, I'm uh, saying that, so the broadcasting is one <laughs> broadcasting station, but that's it, they are like, Twenty people around, right, right next to your. Oh, so basically, all your phones are basically on listening mode. Okay. When you set it up, it's on listening mode. So all the ba all the different uh, Bluetooth, uh, iBeacon based stations will be broadcasting. So as long as there's people in the room. Um, so there's no limit to. But they're not broadcasting. But when you say when you say major and minor number, any IP. And then the MAC address fetches the IP. number, just a digit. For for the retailer to identify, okay, you're now close to this. Yeah, the digit is equal from one to nine. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's like the MAC address. Why are you using barcode or why are you using your Wi-Fi and your phone? You want to put it in. Yes, you can. But so I'd be walking around, around, around yeah. my house, and I would be like, oh, he's now next to here. Right. My house, he's now next to here. Based on, on the okay, there is actually a, right, if you ha haven't had time to play around with the Raspberry Pi and do all that, you can actually just use the app. Uh, that is available and then turn it into a trans you can turn it into a transmitter. So this <laughs> on my phone, I can transmit. Yeah. He's transmit okay Adrian over there has the same app as me, he's transmitting and I'm tracking. So now I'll start tracking and you found him. It's fast. And if I go a bit closer to him. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> No, but I, I think that's a yeah. signal bouncer. Yeah, so could it be because Bluetooth operate at the same frequency as Wi Fi? That's why you have some difference. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Just what did people say? You know, because Bluetooth operates. So, yeah, so like in my experiment when I, uh, 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 when I, so anyway, when so I was playing around with this, I, was, I set up a Raspberry Pi at that table, my iPad mini was on the other side of the room, I was like, able to walk from one to the other, it was able to change from, uh, minor one to minor two, so basically it was able to, uh, to kind of locate me between the two lo locations, which is pretty cool because I think uh, there have, have been people saying that look, iBeacons is going to take over um, the role that NFC was trying to do, right? Whatever. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's, there are some. There's no, some like, honestly, I mean, Google. I'm not working for Google. Google get this Wi-Fi indoor stuff. Yeah. Your Wi-Fi is always on. Your Bluetooth most of the time is off for most of the people I know Bluetooth is off. That's true, that's true. So Wi-Fi in working so it's Maybe in terms of power this is more efficient, but yes. Bluetooth Bluetooth four is lighter in terms of power than yeah, Wi-Fi. Very much. Yeah, but you always have your Wi-Fi on. That's just the that's true. preference. <laughs> and you have you need to have an app up <laughs> on and on. Which is uh yeah, you depend on exactly what you are willing to do, but if you're willing to just do locations yeah. locate yourself within the building honestly right. having an app all in the morning right you could like work with, I mean this I could imagine companies like Starbucks or some retail chain using this yeah, as a, a layout. It's an ad, it's an ad on the ad system. It's an advertising delivery system. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. it. But you can also monitor. You can, uh, no, yeah, it's not too weak. But uh, the problem it, is that always like tracking, tracking. No, no, no. It's not two ways, but it's working an app. So you have to do yeah, anything yeah. you want. So it's a, at the end, it's a way people are going to use it. The new thing they have if you don't have a phone and running, the Bluetooth Lower layer can actually ping. Yeah. So, All right. Cheap. So, uh, yeah. so yeah. Good. Thank That's you. it. Uh, thank you. I will post it on the uh, website. Cool. Is there any questions? Uh, any other questions, guys? Uh, yeah. 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 No? Is there a tutorial? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Where do you get this t-shirt? Cool. This one, actually, these guys came with the one on 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 Alright, okay, that, that concludes the list of speakers. Is there anyone else that would like to share something or has prepared anything that they would like to show any of us? Nothing? No? Okay, so I think that's that then. Thank you very much for everyone for coming. This is an absolutely amazing turnout. Uh, there's a lot of new faces and I really hope to see you guys for the next installment. I would really appreciate if you guys can tell me, uh, you can message me on Facebook or just post to the event page itself as to what you're expecting for future events, what kinds of events you would like. Uh, Brahim mentioned something earlier today. He would like to present workshops, if we can put up a workshop. Well, I think it's uh, if people want to learn about the, I mean, you know, what I've done here, it doesn't really cost anything to have the ED or programming, we can mm. do yeah. some yeah. sessions. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it might be good to, um, so, to have breakout sessions. Yes. So perhaps to have, you know, perhaps not necessarily a, a evening thing, but perhaps set up a place where, mm. you know, we can have s different stations where people can go to learn and to make it more about learning than presentations. You could have a yes. Raspberry Pi Maker Fair. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was like thinking. That. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think then we can rope in a lot of noobs. Okay, sure. Yeah. Sure. Right. Well, I am out the details on that one and keep you posted. And that's it for, for now. Thank you very much for coming. Very quick, very quick comment. Um, yes. the, the move the money it. jar to be more accessible for those who would like to give us a donation Thank so we can much. move and renovate the new place I when we get there. Start by making my yeah. I'll leave it in here so when people can go, otherwise, hard to find again. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Hey, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Il y a un plateau et euh, tous les trucs que tu mises dans un cube. Donc tu peux poser euh, sur, euh, sur quelque chose. Euh, 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 J'en ai quelque chose à dire. Ouais,